no more curtain. On Calvary's hill, Jesus cried out in a loud voice and died. Then the curtain in the temple was torn into two pieces from the top to the bottom. What did 1,500 years of a curtain draped holy of holies communicate? Simply, God is holy. God is holy, separate from us and unapproachable. Even Moses was told, you cannot see my face because no one can see me and live, Exodus 33, 20. God is holy and we are sinners and there is a distance between us. But Jesus hasn't left us with an unapproachable God. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 2, 5. When Jesus' flesh was torn on the cross, the curtain was torn in two. With no hesitation, we are welcome into God's presence, any day, any time. The barrier of sin is down, no more curtain. Remember Jesus. Take the bread, and this represents Jesus' body. And the juice represents Jesus' blood. Dear Lord in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house today and, and praise your blessed name. And thank you that you rose again for us. To, and we know that you're always there for us. And if we ever are in need, all we need to do is ask and you, you will answer. May not always be the answer we want, but you will answer. We, we thank you for the people that are here today. and. Please bless the ones that were unable to come that for whatever reason that you'll watch over them and guide them through this week. And be with each of us as we go through this week that our lives may touch someone's heart that we don't even know that they need, but you know their need. And if we are there and you use us, that will be a blessing to you. We ask this in your name, amen. Before I get into the sermon, I think it's appropriate that we take a moment to pray for the people of Ukraine. So let's have a, just a moment of silence and you pray for the people and then I will pray. Let's have a moment of silence. Each in your own way, pray for these people. Dear God, we pray for the people of Ukraine, for all those suffering or afraid or hungry, that you'll be close to them and protect them. We pray for world leaders, for compassion, strength and wisdom to guide their choices. We pray for the world that in this moment of crisis, we may reach out in solidarity to our brothers and sisters in need. May we walk in your ways so that peace and justice become a reality for the people of Ukraine and for all the world. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. When you think about the future, how do you feel? For most of us, when we think about the future, it brings all sorts of feelings, worry, anxiety, hopelessness, frustration. There are lots of good reasons to feel that way. A global pandemic virus, wars, sickness, death, and so on. Events and thoughts like this make us ask ourselves some scary questions. Questions like, do we have any real security in this life? What does the future truly hold for us? Can we find freedom from fear, anxiety, and worry? 
What if I told you, because of Easter weekend, the future is full of hope? We're going to look at a short passage from the book of Colossians. If you'd like to turn to Colossians. In it, the author, the Apostle Paul, is going to tell us three reasons the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us a hopeful future. Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to read the first four verses. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Let me repeat that. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. Let me repeat that. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The future is hopeful because we set our hearts on things above. That means to put heavenly priorities into daily <coughs> practice. We are to get our directions from Christ, not the culture around us. Setting our minds and things above means concentrating on the eternal rather than the temporary things. It provides the antidote to an empty life because following Christ means loving and serving those in the world. Regard the world around you as God does. Then you will live in harmony with him and see others as God does. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians, our bodies will be made new. We'll experience a resurrection too. I don't know about you, but as I get older, I'm looking forward to an upgrade on my body. I'm tired of my health issues. How about you? Apostle Paul says Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. But what does the resurrection really mean? Christianity is all about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we talk about the resurrection, we mean something specific. Jesus rose bodily from the tomb, not just his spirit. After the crucifixion, when people saw Jesus, his risen body, they touched him, flesh and blood, scars and all. And people talked with Jesus and even ate with him after the resurrection. It was his same body, but new and different. Our resurrected bodies will be the same. They will be real. Theologically, the resurrection of Jesus is important for several reasons. First, it confirms his deity. Jesus was not only a man, he was God. Jesus was God incarnate, God in the flesh. Christians have always believed that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man at the same time. Lots of religious figures in history claim to be God, but only Jesus proved he was God by raising bodily from the grave. Second, the resurrection of Jesus was a public display of God's victory and triumph over three great enemies we have. Those enemies are sin, Satan, and death itself. Because of the resurrection, sin no longer has any power over you. Satan, the enemy of your soul, has been defeated. Death does not and will not get the final word. That's why we call the message of Jesus the good news. Over one billion people in the world celebrate Easter because we all believe that we'll experience a resurrection too. Actually, everyone will experience a resurrection, but not everyone will go to be with Jesus forever. God will not force people who don't believe in Jesus into a relationship with him. Instead, will God give them what they want? That's why C.S. Lewis said so famously, hell is locked from the inside. Hell is locked from the inside. Christians believe that there's a day coming when Jesus will return to this earth again. On that day, all Christians from all ages will be united together with our resurrected bodies. New bodies without sin, without disease, without sickness. Not only will we receive a new resurrected body in the future, Paul tells us a second hopeful reality about our future. 
Our future is secure and heaven is real. What happened after Jesus returns and we are resurrected? What happens? The answer is we go to heaven. Heavenly bodies will go to the heavenly place. How do you picture heaven? Science fiction writer Isaac Asimov says, I don't believe in the afterlife, so I don't spend time fearing hell or fearing heaven even more. For whatever the tortures of hell, I think the boredom of heaven would be even worse, says Isaac Asimov. Isaac Asimov is wrong. Heaven will not be boring. Heaven is nothing like the show The Good Place either. Heaven is more real, more beautiful, more exciting than you can ever dare to imagine. More real, in fact, even than this present world. The best description of heaven is found in the last book of the Bible, Revelations. Let me summarize some of what's said about heaven. Heaven is a real place. Some people think of heaven as a state of mind or a non-physical realm, but just as God made heavens and human beings, heaven is a physical reality as well. Heaven is a real place where our real resurrected bodies will go. There are walls and gates and stones and gems, streets of gold filling the city. There are fruit trees and animals and a river. If heaven is real, then where is it? The Bible tells us heaven will come down to earth. The earth we currently live on will be completely renewed, restored, put back into the original condition before things were unraveled. Imagine the oceans with no pollution. Forest with no fires. No natural disasters ever. <clears throat> Sounds pretty good and comforting, doesn't it? All the animals of the world and none of them will attack us in heaven. Heaven is a real place that will come to earth as the new heavens and the new earth. Heaven is a holy place. Heaven is a holy place because God is there. The dominant description of heaven is the presence of God. God himself will live with his people. He will forever be in his presence. So if you don't want anything to do with God now, and you're not interested in worship, and you think church is boring, actually, you're gonna hate heaven. Heaven is a safe place. All of us live with a certain amount of fear, knowing anything could happen to us at any time. But in heaven, there'll be no more tears, no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain, and no more pills to take. Why will that be true? Because there'll be no more sin or crime, environmental disasters or sickness or disease, no more heartaches, headaches. Heaven will be a deeply satisfying place. Tonight, millions of people around the world will go to bed hungry. All over the world, people are struggling with their purpose in life and what are they gonna eat next? They hate their job sometimes, they hate their bosses, they're totally unsatisfied with their life, but they can't afford to quit. These things will not be true in heaven. Heaven will be a place of life and fullness. There'll be no lack, no longings, no have-nots. We think the pleasures of this world, its luxuries and comforts, can all only satisfy us, but deep down, we know they don't. All will be satisfied in heaven. To be satisfied with the presence of God himself. Every need and desire you have will be met in heaven. For all these reasons and more, Paul tells us in the passage in Colossians, yearn for all that is above. Feast on the treasures of the heavenly realms. Fill your thoughts with heavenly realities. If you want to have hope for the future, then orient your entire life around the realities of heaven. Your future is secure and hopeful because you have a new resurrected body and heaven will be your home. 
Then Paul tells us one more thing, not about the future, but about our present reality. Our true life is revealed. It's one thing to think about the future. It's another thing to deal with life in the present. Some of you are going through some hard things and you're wondering how you're going to get through any of it. Let me announce our church is full of wonderful people who are far from perfect and dealing with all sorts of things that the rest of us don't even know about. We all have kind of messed up. Welcome to our church. No perfect people are allowed here. Paul says that your heavenly identity is real. The mantra of today is to go and find yourself. Culture says we find our identity by discovering your sexuality, your career, by making your mark in life. Yet Jesus says something completely different. Your identity is not found in who you are, but in whose you are. When Jesus was baptized by John, as he is coming out of the water, God the Father spoke from heaven and said, this is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. God the Father said that long ago before Jesus did anything. God says the same to you and me. You are his son, you are his daughter. He loves you right now, just as you are. No matter what you do or don't do, he's pleased with you, yes, right here, right now. But he wants you to be in a relationship with him. It's not what you do that defines you. It's not your job. It's not who you marry, where you go to school. It's not your hobby. What defines you, where you find true life, is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Like I said, it's not who you are, but whose you are. I've been to Mexico three times. When I lived in Minnesota, I was in Canada several times. I was at the Caribbean one time. But no matter how bad or how good or how wonderful the other places are, my passport says, I belong to the United States of America. That's what Paul is getting out. You live in this world, but your passport says, you belong to Jesus Christ and heaven is your home. Because of the resurrection, your future is secure. You're gonna get a new body, praise the Lord. You'll be in a wonderful place called heaven. You know, where, you know who you are, you're with God in Christ. I wanna end by taking a few minutes to explain clearly what it means to be a Christian follower of Jesus. The good news of Christianity, what we call the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we're more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope for. No one lives up to his or her own personal standards of morality, yet alone God's holy standard. Nobody has ever been able to keep all 10 of the commandments. They all convict us. We've all missed the mark and the penalty of our sin is eternal death and separation from God. But God in his love and his mercy provided a way out, forgiveness, a rescue plan. He sent his one and only son to die in our place and for our sin. Jesus was the perfect and final sacrifice for sin, fully paying the spiritual debt we owe to God. He was then buried in a tomb. Three days later, he rose from the grave. The tomb is empty. His body was gone. We celebrate Easter because the resurrection means absolutely everything to the followers of Jesus. Without the resurrection, the Apostle Paul says, we'd have no hope, we'd have no faith, we'd have no church. If you are not yet a follower of Jesus, there are four things God wants from you this Easter. First, Accept his love for you. Put down your guard and accept what Jesus has done for you. Second, believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. That is what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ. Third, turn away from your sin. You know right from wrong, and you know there's things you should do and you don't do. That's sin also. Repent from that. 
Fourth, commit your life to following Jesus. I'm not talking about becoming more religious or attending church more. I'm talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. For those of us who have been Christians for a long time, do you still love Jesus the way you first loved him? Are you still excited about your relationship with him? Do you still have a deep passion for following him? If so, then Jesus challenges us to feed and take care of the sheep. Who are we investing our life into? For all of us, Jesus asked, as he did Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Jesus says, then follow me. If you love me, follow me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, may we realize today what your death and resurrection means for us. Forgiveness, freedom, ability to walk with you through this fallen world into eternity. May we always find our satisfaction in you, and our willingness to offer yourself to us in Jesus. Dear Lord, I pray for these that are gathered here today. I pray they sense your presence. I pray they are blessed and encouraged. I pray they understand this is not our world. We're just passing through here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.